happy Wednesday, everyone. We're so excited that you decided to spend a little time with us tonight. I want to welcome you all to this Industry Expert Series webinar hosted by OrthoFi. I'm your host, Marla Merritt, and joining me tonight is Tracy Martin, owner of CEO or owner and CEO of Straight Consulting. So we're in for a big treat tonight. Love when we get to hear from Tracy. Uh, for those of you who are joining one of our webinars for the first time, the format is that we bring in some of the industry's most trusted experts, and we just spend an hour learning from them. Earlier this month, OrthoFi hosted an orthodontic business meeting in Denver. We call that meeting Nexus, and if you've never joined us before for Nexus, you don't want to ever miss it again. Um, the theme for this year's meeting was Get Uncomfortable. And during that meeting, we had some of the industry's best speakers talk about topics like boosting revenue without increasing starts, um, boosting adult starts through limited treatment and greater aligner share a chair, and our topic tonight, which is the ortho office of the future. So we will um, be bringing, so the, the content of that meeting was just so stellar. Um, that we are, we've decided to bring many of those sessions to the industry by way of this webinar series. So you're in for a real treat throughout the year and especially tonight. Um, throughout this webinar, you will be able to submit your questions using the Q&A. So make sure you use the Q&A link, not the chat for questions. We'll be uh, pulling those questions. So as you, Tracy says something that makes you think of a question, just throw it in the Q&A. We'll pull those, and then the last 10 minutes, we'll spend just kind of picking Tracy's brain for a minute with your questions. Uh, so make sure you're using the Q&A and not the chat. Um, so getting on to the really good stuff, Tracy Martin is a millennial mom, and as I mentioned, the CEO of Straight Consulting. Um, this is a powerful combination that, that utilizes two of her favorites, generational buying habits and orthodontic practice consulting. Tracy basically grew up in ortho, holding every position over the course of 16 plus years. Um, in offices, she ranged working with startups, multi-practice, multi-doctor, and DSO. Um, Tracy is passionate about the business of orthodontics. And when she's not speaking at regional and national conferences, interviewing ortho luminaries on her Straight Talk series, or hosting Straight Consultants Signature TC and Marketing Mastery courses, she can be found on the road in offices throughout the U.S. and Canada. Tracy's mission is to put a millennial twist on traditional practice consulting and lead the development of next generation ortho teams. And so that sounds like the perfect topic for you tonight, Tracy. Thank you so much for joining us. We can't wait to learn from you. Oh, thank you. That was a very sweet introduction. Um, thank you for having me tonight, guys, and spending this evening together. Um, I appreciate your time, and um, I know it's really valuable, so I will just get right into it then. Perfect. Let's share... Okay, so my Nexus presentation was one of my most favorite presentations, um, mainly because of the topic that Marla tasked me with. Um, it's a really, really fun one. So give everybody a little background real quick. Um, like she said, I'm Tracy Martin. I run a consulting company called Straight Consulting. Um, we are in our ninth year now. Um, and my background is solely in orthodontics. Um, all I have ever done is orthodontics since I got out of high school. I've held every position you can imagine in an orthodontic practice. And I am um, I found my niche, I would say, as a TC and on the business development side and as, um, as an office manager and as an in-house practice consultant before I started my own consulting firm. But I first started as an assistant, as an RDA. And to this day, when I work with a practice or when my team works with a practice, I wear my black fig scrubs into the practice and, um, you know, maybe some fun, cute shoes, but I'm ready to jump in and, and bond a permanent retainer if the day calls for it. So if stuff goes sideways while well, straight consulting's in the, in the office, we're going to jump in if you need us. 
um, because at, at my heart, I'm still a clinician. So I still look at everything from both a clinician side and a um, business development side. Um, my, my team is made up of four Avengers, as I like to call them. Everyone has their superpower. Um, it was important to build this company off of multiple people and multiple perspectives. And, um, as we kick back into our straight talk series, I'm really excited to have this team of Avengers do it because we are made up of, um, you know, Gen X to Gen Z and Republican and Democrat. It's going to be really fun. So I'm very excited to see where it goes. But um, I think that having having a, a team of Avengers has really been um, a big key to our uh, our methods and our the way that we do the way that we do business. So um, before I get into the content tonight. Um, like Marla said, I, I do like to give a little shout out to my kiddos and they're in most, um, most presentations, um, mainly because I do want to point out that, uh, I'm in a really unique point in my life where I am both a millennial and a millennial mother. And all I've ever done is orthodontics. So that's all I know in this world is the operations of an orthodontic office, how we run inside and out every single process from the top to the bottom. And I'm also in the position of being your number one patient demographic right now, You're your number one consumer. My kids are ready for braces. So feel free to text me if you want to do those. Um, but, uh, but yeah, like, so I understand both sides of the coin. So I always like to point that out before I go into these presentations so that you really understand kind of where my, like, where, where, where um, my perspective is coming from, but also why I'm so passionate about what we're talking about, um, because it, it feels like everything is right there. We just have to connect the dots. And, um, and as you know, in ortho, um, some things are quick to, to adapt and change and some things we are very slow to adapt and change. So that goes right into tonight. So, right, we're going to talk about the orthodontic office of the future, um, which I was a little intimidated by that topic, to be honest with you from the beginning, because I, you know, like I know what we're doing right now very intimately in the practices, but what we're going to do in the future could be anything. I mean, we have so many crazy, awesome advances that have happened over this last decade alone that um, thinking of what what will we be like in the future, I don't know. Um, I, I don't know. But when I was, you know, just kind of thinking and pondering on the, the topic itself, I, my brain immediately went to this book that I have that I've read over the last couple of years um, called The Customer of the Future by Blake Morgan. I clearly really like it. <laughs> I just noticed all these today when I pulled it off the shelf. Um, but I love this book. Okay. So Blake Morgan is a futurist. She's also a millennial mom. Um, she's married to Jacob Morgan. So if you aren't on his mailing list, you should absolutely be on it. He specializes more on employee experience and she specializes on um, consumer and, and customer experience. And so many things um, that she talks about makes so much sense sense for ortho. So I had to kind of marry that into this uh, presentation. So, you know, the the customer of the future explains or, or Blake explains in her book um, that today's customers are demanding frictionless, personalized on-demand experiences and services. And the companies that don't adapt to those things are the ones that are going to, to lose out or fizzle out. And I, I have to agree. And as a consultant in 2024, it, and I, I work in practices at least three weeks out of the month. So I'm in a, at least three practices each month. Okay. Um, and I can tell you from my heart, we are not there yet. We, we do not have frictionless personalized on-demand experiences by far, but I, I, I think that we're on the right path. And I think that the practice of the future is going to have that built into its DNA. So, okay, four things that I know that we can plan for in the future. It's going to be that the practices of the future are going to own patient experience, employee experience, digital transformation, and marketing. 
those four areas I know we can plan on. And I know that those are four areas that we should be very intentional about where our path is going to be into those um, areas. Clinically, I don't know exactly. Um, there, that that one's it's a whole nother presentation, but those four things I know for sure um, we have lots of control with and um, could can make a huge, huge impact on right now today. So let's break down each one of those real quick. So patient experience. So why on earth am I talking about patient experience? Um, as I made this slide, I thought, dang, don't we talk about patient experience at every single conference? Do we not talk about patient experience in most lectures um, and probably in, in most webinars, right? Like we are talking about patient experience every single year and we have been for decades and decades. <laughs> um, but we still need to talk about patient experience because by like the majority, there are absolutely exceptions to this, but as a collective group, we are still lacking here. We still have a long way to go. There's, there's far more for us to grow into. So that's why we're going to talk about patient experience again, but I promise to make it a little bit more interesting, I hope. Um, okay, so customer experience is going to be the differentiator as we move into the future. And Blake will explain in her book that why that came about. Um, the, the three trends that, um, that are behind that is one is the rise of the experience economy. Another is the power shift from the company to the customer. We all know that that's there. Um, and advances in technology that now allow us to create more powerful customer experiences than we've ever been able to do before. So um, as, uh, you know, last year at Nexus, I spoke about customer experience and, or, or I, I apologize, I talked about customer service. And, um, and, and I do this when I work in a lot of practices, I, I have this perspective that we are no longer in healthcare. We like, we're, we're not, we are in customer service and the service that we happen to provide in our customer service is orthodontics. Um, and so last year at Nexus, I gave this, um, you know, speech about millennial service and, you know, providing customer service to millennials, um, and again, you know, is this is customer service that just happened to be uh, orthodontics as our service. But as I um, got back into this book and I and I thought about it further, there is a huge difference between customer service and customer experience. Those are not the same things, and and the practice of the future is going to be really focused on that customer experience or that patient experience. Um, customer service is. Uh, like Google will tell you that it's defined as um, the support that we provide our customers. And in the practice, we provide a lot more than just support. Um, we, If we look at the definition of customer experience, it is the perception that the patient has of your practice. And I think that the perception that the patient is having is often not the same as the per perception that we want them to have. And so that's, I think, where we are weak in our muscles and we need to work on, on that area. If you are familiar with um, McKinsey, kudos to you. If you're not, um, don't worry. I wasn't at all until I became a consultant. And um, McKinsey is a massive global consulting company. Uh, and they found that 70% of the customer's journey is dictated by how the customer feels they are being treated. Again, not how the business wants the customer to feel, but how the patient actually feels. And the patients are looking for simple, fast, personalized experiences from us. That's that's what they're trying to get from each of their appointments with us. And we're going to get into those a little bit more, but we have to remember that, that these whales like Amazon, Spotify, Apple, Netflix they have set the bar for our for our consumers now for our patients that are coming in for our millennial parents and millennials and gen z these are the people who are buying orthodontics from us right now and throughout their entire day they are working with these whales like amazon spotify and apple who make 
everything just as Blake calls it deliciously seamless just this frictionless, easy, fast, simple, personalized experience. And that's what they expect from us when they come into the ortho practice. We have to remember that millennials are the ones who created YOLO, right? Like you only live once. So at Nexus, I was able to ask the, the audience to raise their hand if they, who believes in, um, who, who believes that you only live once? No matter how old you are, no matter what generation you are, no matter how much you hate millennials, I don't care. Raise your hand if you um, if if you believe that you only live once. And I'm going to trust that you guys are listening and actually doing that right now in your your room, and you know your spouse is looking at you like you're a freak. But um, but I believe that most of you would would subscribe to the idea that you only live once. And um, and so that's why experience, that's one of the pieces of why millennials are so big about experience and why that will be the differentiator of whether or not they're going to come to you or they're going to come to the person down the street. Like it's going to come down to that. So um, I, I just, I think it's reasonable. <laughs> I think it's reasonable. <laughs> Maybe that's just my millennial card coming out. Um we have to remember that this generation values experiences over things. Um, they would rather pay more for a better experience on everything. Um, they want to spend their money on travel, entertainment, dining, things that are going to create memories and things that are going to be unique. So they want to experience everything that this life has to offer. And so they're willing to pay a little bit more or seek it out themselves. Um, they're a very pragmatic consumer. So the businesses that want to appeal to millennials are going to have to prioritize the experience over everything else. And I love that. I step into that challenge and, and I love it because I feel like we have this wonderful opportunity to be curators for our patients, like actual like curating their patient experience with us. Um, you know, we have this, this opportunity to design experiences for patients that are thoughtful and delicious as Blake would say. Um, but we want our patients to want our experience, to want our practices experience over anyone else's experience, right? We want them to want that. And we want them to want to hang out with us. That's the goal. So we have to be really intentional. If we're going to create that for them, we can't, there's no phoning it in anymore. There's no, there's nothing easy about this. Um, and again, why I talk about this is I really believe that the, the practice of the future is going to have this down because the practices that do have it down, who have made that shift, who do, who do focus on that patient experience very intentionally have 5.7 times more revenue than the ones that don't. And I'm not shallow. I really am not. I just want to retire as early as I possibly can, or at least, you know, be able to retire as early as I possibly can. And I want to make money as much money as I possibly can as early in my life as I possibly can. And so I want to make the changes within my business or within your practice to make sure that we are making the most out of this time that we have. I just like to work smarter, not harder. Um, and practices are adopting this, right? Like this is happening. It's just not happening to everybody. So, you know, here's an example of what, of what patient experience or focusing on patient experience looks like. This is one of our DSO practices. So like take that in consideration that they do have a different budget than others. Okay. Now it's a beautiful suite as they call it, instead of an operatory, their patients are called members, not, not patients. And um, before the patient walks in, the assistant uh, pulls up the slide and, and puts it on the, the foot screen here. And it is customized, personalized to that patient saying, Laura, we've prepped this suite for just for you. Um, in addition to that screen, there's also a screen on the ceiling above the patient. And 24 hours before the appointment, the patient is texted and says, hey, we're so excited to see you at your appointment tomorrow at 10 o'clock. What, what have you been binge watching on Netflix? We want to go ahead and have that queued up for you. 
And so my show is ready for me when I come in and I'm, I'm given a set of beats to listen to while they do my appointment. And it's lovely. The patient can just zone out and to a millennial mom, that's kind of nice sometimes, just saying. Um, here's another example I wanted to give just to, to give a couple. Um, this is my actual dentist and this is my actual text message thread with them. And they text me before my appointment and said, you know, hello, Tracy, your massage chair is waiting for you at 8 a.m. We can't wait to see you smile. That's my dentist. And then says, friendly reminder, $50 fee will apply to cancellations made less than 24 hours. Contact us at blah, 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 blah. As you can see, I wrote back and said, did you say massage chair? And they said, ha, yes, we actually have massage chairs. So yeah, sign me up for that. I don't even care that you were, you know, reminded me about a $50 fee because you started so strong and it's, it's such a positive of a massage chair. And they do, they have little massage chairs and it's great. I actually got a cleaning yesterday. So, but it's thinking through like, how can we really be intentional about that patient experience? And they personalize it for you. Um, I think overall, I'm just going to say it. We have let our priorities slip. I think that we've let our priorities slip since COVID. I think we've been very raw as a team, as an industry, just as business owners, everyone's raw, everyone's tired. Um, and we have let our patient experience slip. And I think it's time that we take it back and we work on it really hard. The practices, the practices of the future will not take these opportunities to work with patients for granted. Um, practices today, many of them lack a buyer's perspective. And we forget how many choices these patients really truly do have. I'll give you a very quick story. Um, I was in a practice in the last two months, two and a half months. And um, one of the first things that we do when we work with the practice is we do a really deep like analysis on the, on the practice, kind of taking measurements of everywhere. So we can see, you know, like, how are we currently performing? What has been working? What hasn't been working and where, what kind of goals do I need to make and how, what kind of strategies I need to make to get them where they want to go. And as I was doing this recon visit at a practice, I happened to be kind of offset from the front desk, uh, kind of tucked away, talking to the office manager, just asking a thousand questions. And I noticed a patient walk in to this large reception. They have three front desk coordinators at the front desk. Um, one was checking out a patient and um, one was on the phone and one, one was, um, was typing some notes into ortho two. And, um, patient walks in, she walks up to the front desk and she, she walks in with a big smile and kind of like takes a deep breath, like ready to say hi. And the front desk person does not look up at her. She just keeps on typing. And we all know from experience that you can see the person that's sitting right up above you. You know, you know that there's a body right there. There's no world where we're just so zoned in that we didn't see this person. She knows she that she's there and she's just choosing to keep typing and, um, and doesn't acknowledge it. Doesn't even say, I'm so sorry, one second, nothing. She just keeps on typing, doesn't change at all. The patient's face goes from to like, are you for real face? Like, are you really doing this right now? And I'm just dying. And at, at six seconds of watching this happen, my heart starts pounding, freaking out. And I'm just going to watch this play out. Cause I really have to know how, where does this go? Like, how do you come back from that? Cause we're already at six seconds in and it's not changing. And this patient's getting more and more pissed off by the second. So I just started counting with my fingers. Like I wanted to know like how far this was going to go. How long has it been? How far is this going to go? And, um, it got to 22 seconds. And if you can imagine how pissed someone gets in 22 seconds, I can assure you it's very pissed. Um, and it's totally not cool. It's totally wrong, but this practice had lost its gratitude 
for patients. It hadn't had a lot of competition. And I get that. I get told that a lot. I'm like, I get told from practices a lot. Well, we don't have a lot of competition in our area. So we're pretty lucky. That's not an excuse to, to give this patient that kind of customer experience. It was terrible. So needless to say, it's now my example that I can blast across the world um, as a terrible of what not to do. And of course, this practice has changed that. That will never, ever happen again. But it's just terrible to see that that happened this year. That happened in 2024. We're still doing it. And that is why we are still talking about patient experience. <laughs> so if we want to change it, then we, like any good coach is going to tell you the very first step is mindset. It's always got to be mindset because if we don't have our mind set set on changing for like for patient experience and getting patient centric then we're never going to change so that said um even this year i heard things like we're short staffed we're just so busy i have to do everything um i have to do all of that in my consult appointment do patients expect us to work nights and weekends at, at what point does this become the patient's responsibility? When am I supposed to get that done? So I say all those not to blast people um, because people listening will know if they are the ones who said that, but to show like we don't have our mindset right and we have a lot of room to grow there. So get our head right, get our hearts right, and then we can do this. Um, a great example of customer experience mindset is Jeff Bezos. Jeff Bezos... Um, he is excited to serve and he gets everyone at Amazon to drink that Kool-Aid. And because they have all drank that Kool-Aid, that mindset is actually the secret of Amazon's success. Um, I will make this really fast. Jeff had a meeting and you may have heard the story. Jeff had a meeting with about 30 executives during the holidays. So imagine Amazon at the holidays at Christmas. It's nuts. It's crazy. And he's, you know, in this board meeting with 30 executives and he asks the head of customer service, he asks how long the current wait is if someone were to call the customer service line. And the executive doesn't really know. And he says, uh, it's, he says, it's under a minute. Jeff thinks that that's odd. So he calls the customer service line and a minute goes by, two minutes goes by, four minutes goes by. And finally, Amazon gets on and says, you know, this Amazon customer service, how may I help you? And that executive decides to quit and resign um, by the end of that day. And that's why Amazon is so successful and, and sets the bar for everyone else because their CEO, their leader, wakes up in the morning excited to serve and wow their customers. He's zealous for it. And that's what we need. That's what we need. Our purpose needs to be to make our patient, like looking for ways to make our patients' lives easier and better and to continue looking for more ways to make their lives easier and better. And I think that's where we will find ourselves as offices of the future competing on thoughtfulness. So- that's my two cents on patient experience. So that I think we're going to be competing on thoughtfulness in patient experience and employee experience. Um, everyone probably knows uh, Stephen Covey and wonderful author, but he also said, always treat your employees exactly as you want them to treat your best customers. And I, lo I love that. I think that that's a really great mindset to have about this. Um, we are never going to make money or attract great team members on accident. It is going to start with our culture. And I will be fully transparent and honest with you right now, like looking you dead in the camera. Culture is the thing of the year right now. That is the area that I am seeing so many practices suffering in right now. So culture is going to be a huge piece to this. Um, we have to build our our culture um, off like in, I'll get to this on the next slide, but it's gotta be simple and actionable and it can't be fear-based. Fear-based being like, if you don't do this, you're fired. It's gotta be inspirational-based. Now, fear-based is easier. It takes less work, honestly. And it 
seems to make a lot of like logical sense to some people, but inspiration-based cultures are like um, a team culture is going to be far more powerful than any other, but it is harder. It's more emotionally taxing. And I, I understand that far more, you got to be far more intentional. Um, again, I think that as we move forward, if you're going to create a patient centric culture, it's got to be simple, actionable, and memorable. And it makes sense that how we feel as employees, how we feel at work greatly impacts the patient experience. Those two things are tied hand in hand. It's just like a chef and a sous chef. If they're in the kitchen, they're fighting, their anger or tears are going to drip into the food. So we have to be, we have to, to be just as focused on that employee experience as we are with our patient experience. Um, and the companies that do employee experience really well have 4.2 times the average profit of those who don't. So there's a good reason to do it. We have to hire people who are emotionally intelligent, normalize candid conversations to create a culture of transparency. I really like normalized candid conversations in that too. Um, and then talk to your team and learn what do they like and what they don't like about the current culture. And then we can make real actionable changes. I think we get lost in some of the operational efficiencies and the, the our why behind things kind of get, get put aside and, and lose it in the priorities. I think that as you look at your culture, you need to be really focused on developing mid-level management. Mid-level management is the secret right now, my friends. You know, our doctors are burned out, our managers are burned out, and and the the secret behind it all is a really strong org chart. I promise you, it really is. It's a strong org chart with leads in each of the departments, and and take off some of those responsibilities and some of that weight um, off of our top leadership and spread that out. The the leads, your your team knows your patients better, can represent their needs, wants, wishes, and desires better than you can. They have deeper relationships with your patients than you do. And, and you can't hold all that responsibility on your shoulders. You've got to spread it out. And that, if you can do that well, you, I promise, will have done something that most practices can't ever do. we got to be focused on designing zero friction leadership. Um, this is Brian Cornell. He is the CEO of Target. And I thought what's really cool about him is he loves to know what Target customers want, wish, and desire. And Target's number one customer is the millennial mom. Same as us, right? So in order to learn more about what they want, what their wishes and desires are, he um, he goes ahead and uh, he actually goes to their homes and he visits their homes and stays with them and he learns how they use Target's products. How do they use them? What do they need more of? What do they need less of? And then he, he essentially experiences the customer experience as the customer does and not how Target wants them to. So, and then he, he you know, uses that feedback loop to make real changes within Target. And that's why I don't know a millennial mom that hates it. It's amazing. Target is, Target is the Mecca uh, for the millennial mom. So it just makes me wonder, like, do, do we do that for our patients? Do we do that in our practice? How do we do that, right? How do families feel when our teams communicate with them? How do they feel when they're waiting in our reception? What are they seeing? What are they hearing? What are they feeling? Um, you know, do we make things easy for them? Do we do we make things easy for them to get their information that they need, like with post op instructions, with um, with with our texts, our emails? What is that communication like? Um, you know, are we always coming off as we think we are? Hope so. Um, hope so. As a team, we need to be looking for more and more ways to remove hurdles for our patients. Um, and, and I'll, I'll give an example. Um, so you can see like of people getting intentional about that. So one thing that I've coached on, you've probably heard lectures or trainings on this with me before, but I'm really big on a TC call before you come into, before patients come into the appointment. Um, we've, you know, shifted to a lot more TC videos than we do TC calls anymore because millennials absolutely don't answer their phone. We want to live in asynchronous life. So we're not going to answer that phone, um, unless you just happen to get me on a lucky day. But that said, um, 
our why behind doing TC calls is we want to prepare this patient before they come in. We want to get them 80% ready to buy before they come into the appointment. It makes the consultation and the conversion so much easier. Um, and we're not the only ones who do that. The DSOs are also doing that. So they're also doing TC calls, but not only are they doing TC calls, but they're also now um, looking for more ways to remove more hurdles. And they are now pre-approving patients for financing. So let me back up. Part of my strategies with the TC call is that I want my TCs to go over the orthodontic benefits. So they, you know, take the new patient call, they um, they put the patient into OrthoFi, OrthoFi verifies our benefits for us. And then right before the patient comes in, our TC is going to call the patient, connect with them and, or send a video. And they're going to also go over the insurance benefits with them um, wherever possible. And my hope is to spark a financial conversation before they come into the visit. We've had huge success with it. And, um, and so then, you know, We've worked with other organizations on this as well to do it at scale. And um, and then some have taken it even further. And now not only we'll go over those, go ahead and, and let the patient know of their, um, their out-of-pocket expense after our insurance, but then also goes ahead and pre-approves them for financing should they want that as well. So phenomenal way to go ahead and remove more hurdles for their patients. Um, they call it an, an accommodation rate, and that is emailed um, to the patient ahead of time, or it's gone over during that TC call. So really cool. I like where their head's at. Um, that third thing that I mentioned was digital transformation. So I just want to kind of highlight on this just a little bit, uh, because the, the, the practice of the future is going to it's going it, to, it's technology is going to be like the bloodline in it. So it's going to be everywhere. Um, one of our, one of our clients was financially backed by the same, uh, by, by the same company that started, um, one medical and their CMO, Doug Sweeney said that from the beginning, technology was at the core of the offer. And, um, and so the whole entire place is built off of technology. So digital transformation is just, you know, within the DNA of, of this, um, of this corporation. And on top of that, they added, you know, mobile first online scheduling, same day appointment that actually starts on time. They have apple cider in the waiting room. No phones are at the front desk so that that way the receptionists can be completely focused on hosting those patients. And the average wait time is less than one minute throughout the whole organization. So that's huge. Um, they have high quality care at affordable rates, which is very big for a millennial. We like the words affordable, not cheap, not the same thing. And, um, you know, they have text message, text message reminders to remind them to come to these beautifully built out locations. Um, and they, they focus on personalized care with clear communication and sensitivity is a priority for them. So really great company, in my opinion, they're definitely going far. And I think, I think we're going to see as we move into the future, more and more concierge style practices blooming. Uh, a couple of things we can learn from One Medical, right? We can learn that we need to create seamless onboarding so our customers can easily sign up for our services. We want to automate paperwork wherever you can. We've got that with OrthoFi. So we can ensure, and we need to ensure that that patient journey is super easy from start to finish. Um, we know, like, we have to know that our employees will work toward performance goals that we put in place and ensure that those metrics that we're measuring them by are patient centric and not business centric. There's a, there's definitely a difference. Um, and when a patient first enters our practice, um, whether that's digitally or in person, we wanna make sure that that experience is more than just pleasant. It's gotta be more because it's the differentiator. Uh, and then we need to identify added services that we can throw in there, you know, like retainer programs, what other perks are we offering, right? There's lots of things that we can add into it to make our offer even more attractive. Okay, I mentioned all that because 
we really have to focus on this zero friction customer experience um, as, as we move into the future. And I found it also incredibly interesting that um, Amazon actually purchased One Medical last year for uh, $3.9 billion. It was an all cash deal. It was the third largest acquisition in Amazon's history. And um, yeah, I really feel like if this is where Amazon is going, then that's certainly where I'd want my practice to be going. Just saying. Um, we have so many tools to utilize now when it comes to digital transformation. I loved that vi that opener video um, that Orthofy just played, you know, showcasing how seamless that onboarding can be and the reporting. Like that's that's why. I have partnered with OrthoFi for this many years now because it makes my job easier as your consultant, but it also makes your conversion rate go, go up, which makes me happy. So, um, you know, step one, if you're not on OrthoFi, I'm just going to selfishly plug it in here because it goes right in with, this is part of that digital transformation. Um, your patient is used to working with brands like these. They have this level of seamless frictional technology at their at their in their fingertips and they're using these guys throughout the day like i've probably used all of those this week right at least at least once multiple times for a couple of those hashtag starbucks addict right here um but this is what they're used to in their daily life and they expect that same level of technology in your practice if you in that I know it's asking a lot to make you the same level of technology with Netflix. I get that, but I still think that should be goals, right? Like goals. And my point in it is that like, if this is what I'm using all day long throughout my day and all throughout my week, and then I come into your practice and you're, I mean, some of you are still using paper charts. Yeah, that's real. Was, was in that in this month. So that's real. Um, but there's there's got to be a somewhat similar level of technology being utilized in your practice. We can't call ourselves state of the art anymore. We're not state of the art anymore. Patients want to know how you utilize technology to enhance that patient experience or enhance your employee experience actually too. Um, they want to know how you make how you use technology to make everyone's lives easier and better or the outcomes easier and better or the the patient journey easier and better. And that's where I want us to try to focus on as we look at, at that digital transformation. Like I said, we have lots of great tools now that can help us out um, between, you know, dental monitoring, grin. I mean, there's a huge list that we could go into and do a presentation just off of this itself, but we need to be looking for technology that solves traditional problems in our practice. That's number one. And the second one is that we need to be looking for long-term investments in technology because technology isn't going to go anywhere. It's only going to get more and more and more and become more of that, that bloodline in your practice. So folk, I, I would, I would focus heavily on there. The last thing I want to mention on this slide is AI, like teams, sometimes when I'm working with them, they hear AI, they get scared. AI is not scary at all. I use AI all the time. I write lots of presentations with it. Um, you know, chat GBT is a good friend of mine. I use it in Photoshop. I've like redesigned and rebuilt my whole shoulder in a picture. Like there's some really cool things we can do. I use it with, um, Canva. I use it in, in all sorts of places. I now use it in financial forecasting. It's, it's fantastic. So um, I don't think we should be scared of it. We just always need to see it as a tool that enhances what we do. It is a tool for us, okay? Um, and I should also mention that a digital transformation makes it sound like there's a beginning and an end, and there's not. It is it is constant transformation. We're going to be doing that for the rest of our lives. Uh, a couple of things I think that you'll see from a digital transformation side of things, I think that you're going to see more and more practices creating their own apps for their patients. Um, I don't know if anyone is using Practice Genius's app for observation patients, but that's a really cool tool. Definitely get a demo with them. I am a firm believer <laughs> that we will be buying our orthodontics on our websites. 
So get ready for that. That is coming down the pipeline in the practices of the future. Um, we will have a little shopping cart up at the top of our screen there, and our patients will be able to choose what their objectives are, whether it's upper, lower, full shebang, what their modality is, what how they want to do it, and then they'll be able to customize their payment arrangements and go ahead and purchase it through a shopping cart. So at some point, we are going to get to the point where we are buying our orthodontics on our websites. So just remember I told you that. I also love that uh, from a digital standpoint, um, you know, our, our data and analytics are getting cooler and cooler and cooler. And as we move into the future, we are going to be able to, we, I mean, we are now, but we'll do it even more. We'll get really used to the muscle of looking forward with our analytics. Um, in the past, we've, we've always looked backwards at, you know, historical things and trying to forecast based off of those things. But I think we're going to be able to get more and more, um, sharp with, with our forward looking analytics. Um, and our digital transformation is going to help us out with that. We can also utilize that heavily in our, our marketing and how we're going to spend our marketing dollars. So that's where I will finish up here is with our marketing. So, um, I love marketing because I love sales and the two are sisters. And, um, and so I focus on marketing just as much as I think I focus on sales. And I know that as we move into practices of the future, they will have, uh, they will, they will be so intentional with their marketing strategies and their focus is going to be on Gen Z, especially because those guys are the, are the, the, the next ones coming. And they're also a larger generation than our millennials are. And so if I was a practice right now, I would be heavily focused on Gen Z and what their wants, wishes, and desires are, and seeing how I can infuse strategies into the practice for them. They are a unique breed. They are entrepreneurs in their hearts. Only 50% of them plan to go to college. 50% of them will start a business instead. And, um, and they are philanthropists at, at heart too, which I think is really cool. I do think that they might be the generation that saves us all. Millennials certainly won't. Um, and I just had a, a couple of things on, on this slide about um, Gen Z. And for sake of time, I'm really not going to go through it too much. But I do want to mention cause marketing because that's, a, I think, a big differentiator with this generation. They want to know that you as a practice have a cause that you're behind. It doesn't even really truly matter what it is. They just want to know that you're passionate about something and that you are going to impact the world positively in some way. So you've got lots of things to choose from, you know, like there's lots of different causes and, um, and charities to get behind, but you, they want to see that on your website. They want to see that in your, um, in your online presence. They want to see it in your practice. Um, they, they find that to be a really important one. So I'm just going to tag that one in there. The other thing that you're going to need to be really focused on when, when with marketing is, you know, we talk about online presence all the time and I am not a, a marketing company that can help you with your, um, online service, like with your digital marketing services. We have fantastic people in this industry that can help you with that. Um, but I can tell you what I like and what I don't like, and I can tell you what I think you should change on, on your sites and what kind of message does need to be there, or what kind of um, information you are lacking or missing because content is huge. But, but prior to that, your, um, your design, your, your content. Yeah, I should, I should really focus there. Um, will be a huge uh, impact to whether or not you're going to get a Gen Z to convert in your practice. They are looking for like quick snack, snackable information from your online presence. Um, and millennials are going to do their pre-search. There's no world where a millennial is going to come into your practice and not have looked at your website and not have looked, um, at your reviews. So, and, and looked at your online presence. Um, and, and I really feel for any practices that are still trying to catch up with that. So if that's not, if you're not super proud of your website right now, then first, first thing that you're going to do tomorrow is call your digital marketing company. We're going to get really transparent with our pricing. That's absolutely going to be a part of the, um, the practice of the future. You will have your prices on your website. I am really surprised that we aren't there yet. 
um, as a majority, but there are lots of practices who are doing it now. So um, please get, get on that one. Okay. It should look something like this, have a couple of levels to it, make it very simple. Don't over complicate it, have as many asterisks as you want to have, um, to get yourself out of sticky situations. Like, you know, surgical is not going to be this, you know, things like that. So you can add asterisks to it and stuff, but it's just going to help your buyers move through the buying process. And it's going to be giving your patient the information that they're, that they're seeking out that they're wanting to have. You're going to need to focus on personalization everywhere you possibly can in that patient's journey. Millennials love personalization. It's one of their core values, actually. So looking for as many ways to personalize each part of the, of the patient journey, not just at the new patient process, where I think we try to focus a lot on, but it's also throughout that new patient or throughout the, the patient journey, all the way through retention. So um, focus heavy there. Um, this is to note that, I don't know if you, if you know this already, but when you're, when you're scrolling on Amazon and it has recommendations for you, I am a sucker for that section. That section is always, always says something like the people who view this also view these items. And I'm like, wow, I really like those too. Like we are so similar. Um, maybe it's that millennial side of me that loves peer affirmation as well and, and crowdsources everything. So maybe that's where this is taken off, but it's personalizing or at least it feels that it's personalizing um, off of my purchases. And that Amazon's personalized recommendation system gives Amazon 35% of Amazon's, all of its sales. So that just shows you how much personalization works for these generations. It's huge. Um, again, you know, these guys are doing it all day, every day. And this is what your consumer is working with all day, every day. And then they've got to feel that in your practice as well. And at least it will for sure in the future practice. So I don't know wherever, like I'm going to wrap this up right now. Um, I don't know where we're going to go. There are endless possibilities. We are already going really cool places right now. I thought that this was always going to be something that I just see in the minority report, but this is our real life today. So I can only imagine where else, you know, we're going to go. Um, I think, I think that we have a lot of room to grow. And I think that now is the time to get on it. Um, patients expect a lot for, from us now, and they'll expect even more from us in the future. So let's not get stuck. Let's not get comfortable. Let's get on it and, and let's go after it. I, this industry is the best industry ever known to mankind and we adapt as we need to, and we, we will achieve everything that the practices of the future will have. So that's all I got for us. Thanks so much, Tracy. Fabulous as always. Love hearing your, your thoughts. And, um, I know you really kind of think outside the box and I know that's so helpful for practices to hear. Uh, we had a comment. This isn't really a question, but I'd love to hear your comment on this too. Um, we agree that Amazon sets the bar high, but they're also burning through employees like no one else. So we'd love to hear your thoughts about, about that, because I know you moved from the customer experience to the employee experience. So how does that all fit together, even with Amazon? That's a really good question and comment. I would say that, that that's an area that we all have to really work on, right? Um you know, Amazon has a ton of, a ton of employees. So I would be, you know, I'm just, I'm just going to make assumptions because I don't have any solid research on that ratio and how that, you know, plays out because, you know, it might sound like a lot, but it may not actually be a lot based off of how many employees they have. But Again, I mean, I, I can give you a huge list of practices that are burning through employees the same way, right? It's like, mm -hmm. we're seeing it everywhere. This is, this is not, you know, just unique to that. So I think that that's always going to be an issue. And the number one way for us to, to counteract that is going to be a, a heavy, huge focus on employee experience. So if, if patient experience is in one hand, employee experience is on the other, and they've got to both be 
super intentional and they take a lot of work and they take a lot of energy and they take a lot of thoughtfulness and we're all raw and we don't have a lot of that left, but that's where we're going to have to go. Yeah. And that's really a good setup for the next question. So um, given the current economy and, and environment where so many people want to work from home, I know that this is a question I get from practices all the time, you know, just like I can't, everyone wants to not work in the office. So I know that that's a thing. So talk to me about how you feel about that and how to kind of combat that. I mean, that could be a whole lecture in itself, but I, um, I mean, I'll just, I'll just be very authentic and transparent here. So I, I understand that. And, um, you know, we have to take, we have to swallow that pill that, a lot of people didn't come back from COVID. It was really hard to get us restaffed again. We are restaffed again now, but that was like every, I don't think that there's a team out there that isn't raw from being short staffed, right? Like, so that's, that said, it was hard to bring them back because people learned that like our team members learned that they could go down to one income and be okay. But they, you know, maybe wouldn't get to have the things that they had had, but the, you know what, being at home with their kids was actually a big value for them because YOLO, because, you know, they, so the, they want that, they want that family experience too. So that said, I understand their why I understand them wanting to work from home. And I think it's time for us to adopt as like adapt as much as we can to it. Um, I think it's kind of reasonable. So that's why I would say a lot of the practices that I work with, I try where it makes sense. I, like this is not a, I don't do anything one size fits all, but where it makes sense, we try to move us towards a, um, you know, we try to get them on remote monitoring so that we can reduce the number of patient days when it's patient days, everyone is got, you know, their hair up in a ponytail, tennis shoes on, let's do this. We are going to rock it out. But then there's lots of days where they are advancing patients treatment and we're doing non non-patient days. We have more non-patient days. And that has given the, um, the flexibility to be able to work from home and to be with our families more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so one of the things that we, we kind of are hearing is maybe there'll be fewer team members, but they will be more specialized. Oh yes, exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I mean, again, we could go into a whole nother lecture about this, but like just throwing it out there, if you are one of the practices that are, um, that are on remote monitoring or thinking about doing remote monitoring, um, you know, we've even kind of gotten this model of uh, we assign each patient as they bond as or as they start treatment that gets assigned to a specific clinician. And that clinician, that assistant is in charge of that patient's entire journey. And 90% of the time always sees that same clinician the whole time and then only escalates questions or needs up to the orthodontist as, as needed. So they act more like a, more like a nurse practitioner, more like, um, you know, more like a nurse mm -hmm. than, um, than what we've had traditionally in ortho as an assistant. Yeah. Which is great. I mean, as an ortho assistant, that's professional growth to me, right? Yes. It's only for the, the ones that want it, who are into professional growth and development. Like you can't want that for a person. So it is sp more specialized more career people. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Going back to the customer experience for, um, for customer experience, do you feel an open bay is good or bad? Do you think that ortho future orthodontic offices will have dividers between the chairs? Ooh, I love that question. I haven't been asked that in a really long time. I honestly think that the practice of the future, if I'm speaking from that perspective, I think that they will be, I would think that they will have dividers and I really love dividers that slide. So that like, if I have both of the twins, I can slide it open and we can have a family experience together. And then mm -hmm. those, then those have parishioners on either side so that we, you know, we're in our own little bubble. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's, that's great. That's really a cool um, concept. So then uh, one more question, uh, practices doing virtual consults. What are your thought about, thoughts about that? And do you see practices going to that more? Oh, I love them. I love them, but I love, um, I think I get more out of smile assessments than I do virtual consults. Um, you know, virtual consults still takes time. So I think that uh, like still take, take space time. I can't do it asynchronously. So I might be a person who might, I might say, 
well, I might as well just go in if I'm going to a lot, you know, this time to this time on this day to this practice, to this business in my life. But I love smile assessments and I think that they are extremely underused and a great way to meet a patient where they are. And, you know, I, I don't, I don't believe in screening patients, um, anymore in person. You always do it on a smile assessment. Very good. Okay. Awesome. Tracy, so much great information. That's the end of our questions. Um, Bear, if you'll throw, slow, throw the last two slides up, um, we're excited to announce a super cool masterclass that we will be doing the day before the AAO, where Tracy and our own Oliver Gellis and their brilliant data minds will come together and talk about winning strategies for adult starts. So if you want to use this QR code to join that um, that lunch, it, it's, it's a, a mini masterclass. It'll just be during lunch. Um, and it's actually on, I guess it's on the first day of AAO, so May 4th. So get all the details here. We'd love for you to join us for that lunch. And I, I can't wait to hear that session. Um, and then also, as, as we typically do on these webinars, if, um, Bergen, if you'll go to the next slide, if you will um, scan this QR code and request a demo, we'd love, if you're not currently an OrthoFi user, we'd love to show you the system and um we are, we're also offering a discount on your uh, setup fee if you are one of the first offices to sign up using this QR code. So we'd love to speak to you about that. Thank you again, Tracy, for a fabulous evening. Love your content and can't wait until the next time we get to be together. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate it.